Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Isa Mester, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We hereby recognize the prior status and enduring diversity of this land and the many indigenous nations that stand in relation to it, particularly the thousands of indigenous children from dozens of tribes forced into the reprogramming camp established at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School starting in 1879. Dickinson College started this agenda, supported this agenda of cultural eradication in both word and deed. Turning honestly toward that shameful past animates this acknowledgement and gives orientation to our desire for a reconciled future. Accordingly, this living land acknowledgement is intentionally incomplete, a reflection of the ongoing process it represents to learn respectfully from the stories of this land and the peoples that carry them, to think reflectively about the injustice in our shared past, and to act responsibly with that knowledge today to inspire a more equitable tomorrow. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, the Dickinsonian, and the Department of Sociology, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, A Conversation on Corrections in Inc. This event is in celebration of 150 years of the Dickinsonian, our student newspaper. On the back of this evening's program, you will find a QR code. We would appreciate if you complete the survey to provide feedback on how you find out about Clark Forum events. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speakers, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speakers and everyone in attendance, please stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. There will be a book sale and signing in the lobby immediately following the program. In the event of an emergency, please note that accessible exits are located at the west side of this building. At this time, I ask you that you silence all cell phones and electronic devices. And I would like to welcome the co-editors-in-chief of the Dickinsonian, Walker Mess and Lauren David. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren David, and I am one of the co-editors-in-chief of our college's student newspaper, The Dickinsonian. I'm deeply honored to be standing alongside Walker Kometz, our other editor-in-chief, as we introduce you to tonight's speaker, Carrie Blakinger. I'm also honored to stand before you today in celebration of 150 years of The Dickinsonian and reflect on the remarkable journey of our publication. Since first beginning in 1872, our newspaper has maintained an ongoing commitment to provide a variety of news coverage to our campus community. But we do not just simply report the news, we engage with it. We do not merely observe events that are happening on campus, we investigate them. We strive to pursue the truth and to provide a fundamental platform for students to be heard, while also upholding standards that maintain our journalistic integrity. The Dickinsonian is also more than just a publication. It is a community where students interested in journalism can find their voice. The Dickinsonian has also been resilient to the challenge, sorry, changing landscape of journalism today. Many other publications from national colleges and universities, like the Daily Collegian from Pennsylvania State University, have had their budgets cut severely and by their respective institutions. Some are in the position where, without successfully acquiring independent funding, are unable to continue publishing. We are fortunate enough to still receive funding from Dickinson College, but face an increasing number of budget cuts each year. Um, we also have seen a rise in the pro prolification of fake news, politics, and the overall polarization of our society, 
which has also darkened the once unquestionable standards of journalism. But despite these challenges, our publication has persevered with the same unwavering commitment to journalism as it did 150 years ago. So today, as we celebrate this remarkable milestone, let us also renew our pledge to uphold the values that have guided the Dickinsonian through its history. Let us honor the legacy of our newspaper by continuing to report on stories that need to be told, amplify the, amplify the voices in our community that need to be heard, and never stray from our commitment to journalistic integrity. And we also wanted to add that at the end of the program, there will be copies of this week's edition of the Dickinsonian available in the lobby, so feel free to grab a copy on your way out. But now I will pass the microphone over to Walker Kmetz as they introduce Carrie Blakinger and our Provost and Dean, Renee Kramer. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. So like Lauren said, my name is Walker Kmetz and I'm the other co-editor in chief. And tonight I'll be introducing our amazing guests. So we are joined by Carrie Blakinger and Provost Renee Kramer, who will discuss Blakinger's memoir, Corrections in Ink, and, work as a, and she works as a staff writer at Los Angeles Times. Blakinger's memoir traces her life story from her untraditional childhood as a competitive figure skater to her struggles with an eating disorder and later addiction and culminates in her arrest and two-year prison sentence in New York. Blakinger's time at the LA Times focuses on the Sheriff's Department and jails. Prior to her current role at the LA Times, Blakinger was an investigative journalist at the Marshall Project, where she focused on mass incarceration. She also has written about the death penalty and prisons for the Houston Chronicle. Blakinger's work has been featured in the New York Times, on the BBC, and in Washington Post Magazine, and she has appeared on PBS NewsHour. And our other guest tonight, Provost and Dean Renee Kramer. She assumed her role at Dickinson this past July, and previously she served as Deputy Provost for Academic Affairs at Drake University in Iowa, and, pr and prior to that position, she spent 10 years at Drake, during which she served as the faculty senate president, as well as the chair of the law, politics, and society department. Kramer is an interdisciplinary sociological scholar whose work has focused on reproductive justice, legal mobilization, and the governance of women's bodies. She is the author of two books, Pregnant with the Stars, Watching and Wanting the Celebrity Baby Bump, and Birthing a Movement, Midwives, Law, and the Politics of Reproductive Care. And like I mentioned before, copies of Corrections in Ink and the Dickinsonian will be available after tonight's event. So without further ado, give a warm round of applause. Thank you, Walker and Lauren. And thank you, Carrie, for being here, for spending the day in Carlisle and hanging out with us tonight. Yeah. It's yeah, warmer here than I thought. I was afraid, it was, I was used to Pennsylvania cold. No, it's Pennsylvania muggy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I lived in Houston for seven years. This is not even, this doesn't rate as muggy. You are true, you're, you're, okay. We're here to celebrate two things. First, primarily you, the tremendous work that you're putting out into the world, and also the Dickinsonian on 150 years. And I know that many of us in the room really want to hear you talk about your life, your memoir, your work. I want to start, though, with getting your thoughts, your perspective on the power of journalism in the world. And when you first became aware of the power of journalism in particular to make change. So I think usually when I'm asked that question, I, I talk about uh, dentures and getting, you know, tell, writing a story that helped get people in Texas prisons dentures, but that is in the book, so y'all can read that if you haven't already. Um, so I'm going to tell a different story. Um, this was, I guess this started during the pandemic and like probably in like pretty early 2020 when a hot blonde chick slid into my DMs on Twitter and she was like, hey, do you want some photos and videos from inside a Texas prison? And I was like, Yes, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um, and so she sent me a video, and it was very clearly inside one of the units, and the lights were out, and there were guys screaming, and there was smoke in the air, and somebody's narrating in a like deep black voice with like a southern accent. Like I wish I could, I wish I could imitate it, but such a rich voice, and he's saying. Like this is nonviolent protest in here. They've, you know, they won't turn our power on. They haven't let us out for showers in however many days. Um, and so they'd started fires 
as a nonviolent protest. And I, I followed up and I, I, I DM'd the chick and I was like, so, okay, so tell me this and this. And I had some follow up questions. And she said she'd go check and she comes back. And um, then she's like answering these questions quicker and quicker. And I'm like, mm. she's not, this isn't, this isn't a blonde chick, is it? Nope. And uh, I, I realized that this was a, a guy with a contraband phone. And eventually she admitted that she was he. <laughs> and, um, and ended up, uh, you know, sending me more stuff from inside that unit. And I wrote a story where I described that this was happening. I didn't show the video because I was worried that, you know, that that person would get in trouble because I thought it was too identifying as to which unit it was at. But I just described it, and uh, the prison spokesman like lost his mind and, um, you know, threatened to. Uh, you know, threatened to have me prosecuted, like said he was going to have me investigated. And, um, and he actually, he actually did call the inspector general. So like the, the, the prison called the prison police on me. <laughs> um, but I did not actually do anything illegal in just, you know, receiving that information. And for the next few months, I kept talking to this, um, I kept talking to this guy in prison and, you know, he would send me photos and stuff. But I wasn't really sure what to do with them because I was afraid to publish them because he would get in trouble. And then he started sending me pictures of the food because during the lockdowns, they were giving them bag lunches that were you know, predictably sort of moldy and small, but like honestly even worse than I thought it would be. Um, there was one photo that he sent me that was like, the, the meal was a hot dog in a tortilla with a whole uncooked potato and like a small cup of I, something unidentifiable. Um, and he, there were definitely times that he was sending me things where they were just getting a peanut butter sandwich um, for a meal or something that was ostensibly a sloppy joe that just sort of looked like, you know, diarrhea on, a, on, a, um, on bread. And as he started sending me these, I was like, this is what I can publish. You can't tell what unit this is from. This is from all of them. Like, I can describe the food being bad day in and day out, but people aren't going to believe it. It's, it's, it's not real until you can show people. And, um, and I did that and wrote a story. And once I did one, then other people were like, oh, we have contraband phones too, and this person can be trusted. And then I start getting more and more. And um, after I did the first story or two, then I started getting other pictures. I started having some guys being like, hey, we actually got better food today. And one guy sent me a picture of broccoli and he was like, this is the first time I've seen a green vegetable in literally years. And you know that was short-lived in a sense. I mean, the lockdowns ended, they stopped giving them the, the Johnny's, the bagged meals. Um, but every time they go on lockdown, they give them Johnny's again. And, you know, sometimes they're still quite awful. I tweet images of them on a pretty regular basis. Um, but after repeatedly tweeting and writing stories about this, because I've written several stories about the, the bad food in Texas prisons in particular, but also like Alabama prisons and Georgia prisons, um, after doing several stories about this in their, when TDCJ, the Texas prison system, released its 2030 plan, like they said that one of their goals was to do away with Johnny's and to stop giving people brown bag lunches during lockdowns and to give them like actual warm food, which is not great either, but is marginally better and at least typically identifiable and often doesn't contain mold. Um, and, you know, for a prison system that has sort of so relentlessly um, done less than the bare minimum, like some, seeing them publicly state that they want to make an effort to make this change, to just have some modicum, modicum of like humane conditions, um, to me, like that was big. I mean, this is something that, that prisoners had been complaining about for years. And I think a lot of people just didn't believe them or thought it was exaggerated. And you know, because I was a journalist with a platform, I was able to, to show people the reality of it. Yeah. So I wasn't, I hadn't even thought to ask this, but, but the way that prison life changed during COVID oh, was pretty yeah. remarkable. And I wonder if you want to comment on that. Yeah. I mean, it was, 
I mean, the, the main thing was that, you know, lockdown means a different thing in prison. Mm -hmm. You know, in, for people who are living in cells, they were typically getting locked in their cells for, you know, days, weeks, um, not necessarily getting showers, um, typically getting some sort of unidentifiable bag lunch. But then for some of the prisons, people were in dorm settings, they were in bunks, and they were literally just being told to not leave their bunk. Um, I remember reality, do you know reality, do you know who reality winner is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. she was in Carswell in, uh, for, in a federal prison in Texas for most of COVID. And um, I remember, like she had some really harrowing COVID stories. That was a medical prison during COVID. So everybody's high risk. And, you know, I, I can't, I feel like a lot of people understood how isolating COVID was in general, but like it's a whole other level when you're talking about like a combination of, you know, having the isolation, but in a more literal physical way with solitary or being, you know, confined to your bunk, not being able to go out and see the sunlight, you know, um, and often not being able to use the phones, things like that. And then also having like, I think a much more present constant fear of death, you know? Yeah, the, the constant fear of contagion in that enclosed environment and the lack of... And you know the medical care is shit. Right. Like if somebody gets it, like there were so many people that I talked to where their whole medical care for COVID in prison was we're putting you in your own solitary confinement cell. I remember there was one guy who wrote me in Spanish and they didn't tell him in English that he had COVID. He didn't know why he'd been put in a different cell until they moved someone into the next cell and he like passed them the paperwork they'd given him and the other guy explained to him in Spanish, oh, they're telling you you have COVID. Like that's why you're there. And I'm imagining a lack of information for incarcerated people about what's going on in the broader world with yeah. COVID. Relatives who aren't incarcerated who are contracting and dying and what we're experiencing. Yeah. And we have some forms of connectivity and they didn't. The one thing that, um, the one, positive change, I guess, was that um, it meant that there was a lot of people who were more able to get and keep contraband cell phones for long periods of time because the guards didn't want to go searching their cells. This wasn't true in every prison system, but in most prison systems, like, it seemed that people were able to hang on to their contraband phones for a lot longer, which was great for me in terms of being able to, like, get access to documenting the conditions. Um, but it's also great for them being able to like stay in touch with their families. And I mean, obviously, yeah, some people are using contraband phones for bad shit, but I mean, some people use regular phones for bad shit too. Um, but a lot of people were using them, you know, for just just to stay amused, like just to be able to keep in touch with their families. Yeah. So I want to come back and, and ask you a couple of more questions about your your experiences in jail and your experiences in prison and and the work that you've done journalistically. But I'm really curious for you what the difference is between memoir and journalism in terms of authority, power, voice, in terms of which you love the most, if you can pick one that you love the most, and, and how you think about them as either synergistically or as very separate, because you, you do both so well. Thank you. Um, so I think you know, one of the things that I really like about journalism is being able to have impact and, um, you know, very demonstrable impact. Like, people have teeth. People have sent me pictures of vegetables, you know? Like, you don't get that from a memoir in the same way. Like, the, the impact is much harder to see. You know, I have individual people who can come up and tell me my book meant a lot to them, but some of the really key ways in which, like, a book can have, like, this can have impact are things I will never see. It's changing someone's mind that I never met. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think um, for me, journalism has, has sort of scratched an itch in a way that I think memoir kind of doesn't. Um, but I also really like, I, one thing I really like about memoir is like, it's the sort of like, it's a really nice blend of like creativity. Like I can be creative in the wordsmithing but I don't have to come up with the plot, <laughs> you know? So it's like almost like writing fiction, except somebody already wrote the plot for you. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you can craft the narrative around yeah. the plot that already exists. Yeah, exactly. Which is actually like so much more decision making than you would think. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I think I sort of thought about it as being like, you know, well, I'm just gonna tell the things, you know? Yeah. But I didn't really realize until I was writing it, um, you know, how many moving pieces there are. Because there's so many things it's like, okay, I'm introducing you to someone. Do I tell her whole story here? Or is this someone you're going to, you know, I'm gonna follow up with you in, in two chapters and tell you what happens later, you know? And then there's the, okay, I can tell this one anecdote about my life in different ways with different takeaways. Is this going to be a, a story about, you know, how women are treated in the system? Is this going to be a story about, you know, collateral consequences? Like there's, there's all these different ways to frame each anecdote and deciding what other facts to give as the context around it is, um, ends up being like a lot more moving pieces than you would think. Also, also underappreciated thing is um, kind of with fake names is way harder than I thought, dude. You just need a long list and you randomize it. No, but you can't because you need to like, they need to have the same vibe, you know what I mean? Yep. Like, no, it's um, like I, I, I can't call, you know, I don't know, like I, I, I can't call like Brandy Juanita, you no. know what I mean? No, I do. Like, and, um, and then I had the problem that I'd be like, I've got all the perfect names. These are, this is how it's going. And then people that I introduce separately come together and suddenly everybody's name in one scene rhymes. Yep. And I'm like, this sounds silly. I can't do this. Yep. You know? I interviewed midwives who were jailed for their practice in states where they were illegal and I gave them all pseudonyms and I let them agree to them and then they would oh. fight me. <laughs> no, that's not. And I'd be like, no, that really is. You are Ophelia. <laughs> then I would listen to them. Um, so those of you in the audience who have read Carrie's memoir, Corrections in Ink, know the story um, that she presents and, and know the narrative that she tells us. So you know uh, I'm about drug use and life before incarceration in 2010 and, and what Carrie experienced. But for those in the audience who haven't, I wonder if you want to give us your version today of a synopsis of what led you to the moment in Ithaca in 2010, and then your experiences, you know, being in jail and being in prison. I am, you know, more than a year into this, still bad at like the elevator pitch version of this book, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I grew up in Lancaster nearby um, and had a, you know, pretty normal uh, childhood except for one thing really, which was that I was a competitive figure skater. So from a young age, I was leaving school around 10 or 11 every morning, going to the rink to train, and I'd be skating until like five and then um, do my homework in the car on the way back. And I skated pairs, which is where the guy like throws you around and it looks all dangerous and shit. And uh, we were good, like we competed at nationals twice. And um, then after our second year at Nationals, my pair partner decided that he wanted to branch out and find another partner. And I just fell apart. I was not all that stable at that point anyways. Like I was high achieving, but I was struggling with some pretty significant depression and some, a pretty serious eating disorder at that point. Um, and skating was really my whole identity, my whole social life, my whole vision for my future. Um, and the thing is with, a career like skating, um, you know, there's so many more women than men that, you know, he could find a partner easily, like oh. the next day. And then for me, it could be like weeks or months or never. And this is also a sport where I remember, like, there was a 23 year old that was referred to as like the old lady. You know, the, the age range for skating is, is so narrow uh, that taking a year off because I couldn't find a partner at 17 seemed like the end of my career. And you know, the end of my understanding of myself or my life or the, where I was going. Um, and so I just, I just unraveled and uh, started doing drugs that summer. I think I like smoked pot once and then did like ecstasy once and then went like straight to heroin. And, um, you know, I was not, that was not like pot is a gateway drug situation, obviously, which is not a thing. Um, but that was just very much like I did not want to be alive. And this was more about dying than escaping. And then, you know, I, I was living on the streets and doing sex work and, you know, addicted to heroin by, um, I don't know, midway through my senior year. And um, I went to rehab and cleaned up 
a little bit, but you know, was still really a mess and didn't have something to fill the sort of hole in my life that was where skating had been. And so I continued to use off and on for about nine years uh, total. And in that time, I started college at Rutgers and then like would take a semester off when I was, you know, when the using got too much. And then I transferred to Cornell because despite being a train wreck, I had managed to at least do well in school in the semesters that I was in school. Um, and then I, I, you know, continued at Cornell um, and got arrested in 2010 during what should have been my final semester. Um, I like, it should have been like, well, it should have been like probably a couple days after my final semester, but I'd asked for extensions on shit because I did not have my shit together. Yeah. Talk a little bit, so I, train wreck, who also is at Cornell, right? And you, you write, I wrote, I wrote down a couple quotes. This was a question for later, but I wanna find them. You talk about being a high achiever and a perfectionist. And on page six, you say, it's a beautiful line, so I'm going to find it. I really will. I am tightly wound, a taut rubber band of perfectionism and self-destruction, and I am about to make things work. And another point, you talk about kind of being an energizer bunny in your both self-destruction and your high achievement. How do you still manage the balance between that perfectionism that's also so much, in my experience at least, self-loathing, and, um, and just wanting to do good because you want to do good? How do you balance? You know, I think that, um, I mean, I, I think that for me, like having an outlet like journalism has been really helpful. I mean, I think writing in general has been really helpful in that way. Um, because I think that in some ways success and failure is, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot grayer. It's not like skating where, you know, you fell or you landed, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I think that that, in some ways, helps me embrace a less black and white view of, uh, you know, of my existence and how I'm engaging with the world. Um, but you know, I think that a lot of it is that, you know, the the words don't have to be perfect. I don't necessarily have to. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily have to have the perfection that I did in skating. I can still have the impact and I can still be happy with the mark that my work can leave. Yeah, thank you. My brain is so dead right now. I no. I said that, that sounded good. It sounded honest. Okay, good. Yeah. So also in the book, you say that you were surprised to learn that there is a difference really between jail and prison and that that's not something you knew and it's not something I think many people know. And you mean it both in the technical way of when you're in jail, you're in one place, and when you're in prison, you're in another. But you also mean the way it feels to be in those spaces. So can you explain what the difference is between well, jail and prison? Well, it's also confusing here because right. you call them county prisons here. <laughs> like every place else, like it would be a county jail and a state prison. I mean, well, not every place else. There's, there's some states that just have like one unified system, like the really small states and stuff. Um, but in most places, county jail is where you would go when you're like first arrested and you would wait there pre-trial or be released. Um, and if you're, if you're sentenced to a short amount of time, you would stay there. Um, so these are not designed for long stays, like a year or two maybe tops. Um, in a lot of jail systems, you know, the average in out time is, you know, somewhere between like 30 and 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're talking about state prison, that's where you go generally if you are convicted of a felony and sentenced to more than usually it's a year. Some states it's like two years. Um, and those are typically made for longer stays. Everybody there is, um, I was going to say is guilty, but has been convicted. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, people, I think, view prisons as like sort of a tougher, harder place. I don't think that's necessarily accurate. Um, they're, uh, 
you know, I think by the time that people get to prison, they're typically in a little bit more stable place. Mm -hmm. And they're more set on, like, creating a sort of longer term life for themselves in some ways, because they're going to be there for a little while. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that prison is generally better. Uh, there's some state prison systems that are just absolutely abysmal. Um, some are less abysmal. Um, I think Georgia probably has the absolute worst state prisons in the country. So I was going to rank them. Um, but yeah, that's some of the basic differences. A lot of people prefer being in prison versus jail just because it's there's more programming options, there's more to do. Um, you usually have more um, access to medical care, more ability to go outside. Uh, I was not interested in that. I did not want to be in prison. I wanted. To, I was like, I don't care where I am. I just want to stay in my cell and read and nobody bother me. Mm -hmm. So was that, that was not what daily life was like when you were in prison. I did read a lot, though. You did read a lot. I did read a lot. But you also but you have prison jobs and stuff. Right, regimented. So you have, yeah, you have specific things you have to do. And, um, you know, it, it didn't, I mean, it, it, some of it is ostensibly, I guess, teaching you some vocational skill. Like I was in a horticulture class. Um, I can't keep a plant alive. Like It didn't help. It didn't work. I didn't, I was never going to be a gardener. Like that was not in the cards for me. Uh -huh. um, I'm actually not sure of anyone who would necessarily be using that class. I remember there was one girl that the professor, that the teacher used to brag about, that did go on to make wreaths and stuff and like flower decorations and shit. Um, so that's not a real high success rate, though. No. <laughs> Hence, I just preferred reading. You you wrote that. Every day in jail and every day in prison, you were in a state, in some ways, of being afraid. But that that fear was not the fear that people who haven't experienced that might, might expect. You know, you weren't afraid of dropping your soap. You weren't afraid of being shanked. What were you afraid of? For me, it was solitary confinement. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think that a lot of people don't fully appreciate how bad that is. Um, a lot of people have, will tell me when I talk about it, they'll be like, oh, you know, I like spending time alone. I think I would, you know, I, I would just want to get away from everyone and all the noise. Um, but, you know, solitary does not really feel like spending time alone. It feels more like getting buried alive. Um, it's also this sort of like profound loss of the things that make us human, you know, because I think some of the ways we understand ourselves as, as, existing at all are self in relation to other, like other people. Like I exist as me in part because it's in relation to you, you know? And then you take away everyone else. And then on top of that, I mean, I think one of the other big things about how you see yourself as human is like the ability to, to make choices, to act, to, have, to make decisions. And when you're locked in a cell alone with no people and so very few decisions, like it really, it really undermines what it feels like to be human. And, you know, I, I think that some people are really dismissive of what that does to you um, because it's not just sort of like a philosophical problem. Like it, 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 is, it really feels like torture. And I think that it's very easy to be dismissive of that because you don't see the wounds. It's not, it's not physical. It's not like, when I'm writing about guys who got beat up by guards or something. Like, these are injuries that you can't see, and I think it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around how severe they can be anyway. Mm -hmm. You write about a number of things that you witnessed or that you experienced. You use the word torture, dehumanization, degradation, humiliation. As you've reflected over the course of the last few years on what you witnessed and experienced, how have you come to understand the people who perpetrated them, the people who experienced those actions, the systems and publics that permit them to continue? That is a very broad question. Um, you know, I, I think that I think that a lot of people don't, just really don't understand um, what conditions are actually like in prison. And 
when they do, I think there's still a gap between that and understanding like why that is a thing that, that people should care about and why that matters. Um, I think there's still a very sort of common reaction to be like, oh, they're criminals, you know, they deserved it. Like, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. I hate that so much. Mm -hmm. um, but I get, I've, I, I get so many comments about that on my TikTok. Like, so many people leave that in the comments as if it's at all an original thought. Like, you were like the thousandth person to say this in just my comments. Like, sit the fuck down, sir. <laughs> but, but, um, but, you know, I, I, I think that whole approach really, that whole train of thought misses the broader issue, which is, that, you know, whatever, whatever the crime is, like, the idea of prisons should be, at a minimum, to improve public safety. I think that's what we all understand the theoretical purpose is, right? And if you take damaged people and damage them more, you are not going to improve public safety. So putting aside, like, questions of abolition and whether prisons should or should not exist, um, I, I think the framing of how we engage on these topics would, I think, have a lot more social benefit if we were talking about it in terms of, like, how can we help create people who are not more damaged? Yeah. We are very far from that place, though. So there's a point in the memoir where it's pretty early on, you write, the system does not care if you understand it. If you're lucky, the women around you do. And you are talking about being in a women's facility. But I read it as, the system doesn't really care if you understand it. And if you are lucky, you will have women around you who do, broadly. And I'm curious just to hear your thoughts on feminism, sisterhood, um, the way that people with marginalized identities, queer people, black people, are able to have each other's backs in sharing information that enables us to walk through the world with a little bit more safety. I really like that reading of that line. I didn't mean it more broadly. Obviously, I meant it in the context of that, but um, but that's so true. It is, you know, it is more applicable broadly. Um, you know, I think one of the I don't think this sort of directly answers this, but like one of the, um, I don't know, one of the things that I've really enjoyed over the past year or two has been finding a community that would have my back, and that was in uh, prison TikTok. Okay, because like I do, I, one does. I well, I TikTok, I do TikToks about prison, right? And what that meant is that um, as I started like getting more followers and meeting more of the people who also are like, you know, creators in that, creators in that space. Um, I ended up getting this friend group of people who spread all over the country who have done time and also are very public about it. Mm. And this was also right around like when the book was coming out. So I was really struggling with just sort of the stresses of being very public about personal stuff and in a very, different way and it, in a different frequency. Like I was sort of used to doing it on Twitter or in like essays, but to be doing sort of all these, you know, direct speaking events and like, you know, being on more video platforms and like sometimes, you know, like getting recognized on the street and shit. Like, and being around this group of people who not only understood um, that, that aspect of having a, a public life in that sense, but also had done time, mm -hmm. was just so magical. And we've ended up, uh, we've ended up being friends and like, you know, we, there's a group of us that we try to get together like every six or so months. Um, and it's been, I've, I've learned so much from them. Like we've got a wide variety of amounts of time that we've done um, from like, you know, from me with like two years to like somebody who'd done like, I don't know, 25 or so. And we've got people that are, um, I guess, early, oh no, we have some in uh, early or late 20s and then up to like someone who's like late 40s, early 50s um, from all over the country. Like some of us are from, uh, you know, there's some from Texas and Pennsylvania and uh, Florida and Virginia 
and you know, obviously now I'm in California. So it's just been this great virtual group. I think it also made moving cross country easier because I felt like I still had a friend group wherever I was geographically. Yeah. So I want to I wanted to shift a little towards process and and a little less about uh, heavy and just. I'd love to hear, so from my perspective, you get to choose projects, you get to research, you get to fact check, you get to timeline out, you get to write outlines of things, like I miss outlining things. You get to write. How do you, how many projects do you have going at once? How do you choose which one you're gonna prioritize? How do you take care of yourself when you're in the really hard places, both physical places, but also the hard place where everything you write you think probably is horrible and you know you just have to keep moving. How do you do it? Um, so I have, I always have like a lot of different projects going on of varying lengths. Um, I like to have, you know, some sort of quicker turn stuff um, and some like medium length and uh, then I feel like I usually have a few sort of longer term things going on, whether that's, you know, a book or like a second book or, um, you know, this magazine article that I've been working on for three years that came out a few weeks ago. So like I, I always have like different lengths of things going on. And I think that's also good for if one thing just isn't working and I don't feel like the words are coming together well, I can turn to something else. Yeah. Um, which that that has been really nice. And, you know, in terms of self-care, um, you know, I'm, I'm not great at it. Um, I, or actually I take that back. Yeah, thank you, take it back. I, I, I think that a lot of people that I, I think people that don't know me well would interpret my life as being someone that is not great at self-care, but I think my self-care needs are just very different. Like for me, um, work is, self-care because to me like my job is it, it's not like I'm a banker I don't like go nine to five and like that's it like to me my work is like deeply meaningful and fulfilling um so I I do though have to try to lighten it because I do cover a lot of death row um I do cover a lot of you know stories about people dying in prisons and jails and things. And I do that some by just trying to write silly features as much as I can. Like mm -hmm. I did a story where I was, um, I, I used someone's mermaid tale and I wrote about being a mermaid. And I went on a Bigfoot hunt one time. We did not find Bigfoot, obviously. Oh, what do you mean obviously? He was hiding well. He probably just doesn't like felons. Tell him, <laughs> tell him what happened you. when you put that mermaid tale on, please. <laughs> um, I, so it actually turns out that being a mermaid is harder than you would think. The tails uh, actually, it's not that they drag you down, it's that you can't get underwater. They're so buoyant and like there's so much surface area, it's actually hard to stay underwater. Um, so yeah, it, it was like, I couldn't get to the bottom of the pool. I was like trying to, you know, I was not good at it. Um, I also fell out of the pool out of an in-ground pool, because one of the things that the mermaid like teachers were trying to tell me how to do was to do like a, a handstand in the pool so that your tail, you can get a picture of your tail up above the water, right? Hard. I fell out of the pool. <laughs> 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 but I wrote a very cute story about it. And you know, and I try to do, I try to do stuff like that. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I will say though, it's, I, sometimes I don't realize how dark the work is until like in retrospect, um, like writing the book, I didn't realize how much it would affect me until like I'd get to, like I'd write a really dark chapter and then finish it and then the next week be like, wow, I was really a bitch last week, wasn't I? Um, and now that I'm in California and I, I am still covering death row some, like there's some chance this ends up being um, a significant chunk of like a second book. Um, and I, I, I did realize though, it, I feel like I, stepping away from the constant um, death row coverage and also stepping away from uh, covering something as, as dark and perpetually broken as the Texas prison system. Like I, a couple months into being in LA, I was like, I do feel like lighter in that sense. Like not, constantly talking to people who are waiting to be killed by the state. Um, I do still talk to some of them constantly, but not as many. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I didn't realize sort of how how dark that felt on like my soul. Yeah. Well, and because you can have those stories and you have a place for them and you can make things better with them, but you also still are given them. Yeah. So I want to appreciate one thing about your book and then I want to appreciate something else and ask you a, an end question and then we'll open it up to the, to the way that conversation happens after this. So I always tell my students you have to read the footnotes. And I, I tell that because of the Caroline Products case where there's a really famous footnote that defines substantive due process. Right? It's the most important footnote ever written in legal text. Fight me. You have <laughs> one footnote in your book. And it is the <laughs> word. It, bitch. It, if you haven't read the book, go to page 181, footnote one. Um, and you made me just happy because you footnoted <laughs> something. And I read it. <laughs> Um, the other thing I want to appreciate about your work is before, I, so I knew I was going to be meeting you, and I hadn't read the book yet, and I get, moving to Pennsylvania enables me to get the New York Times delivered in print, which I couldn't do when I lived in Des Moines. It was a day delay, and who wants that? So now I get it every day, and I get the magazine on Sunday, and that is my gift to myself, the crossword puzzle in the magazine. And I read this amazing article on Dungeons and Dragons in prison, and I gave it to my 18-year-old gamer and said, read this. And then I looked at the byline and I was like, I get to meet this person. I love that piece. Thank you for that piece. Tell us about it and tell us what the heck is next in terms of what next are we going to open the New York Times Magazine and see you writing or where do you want to go next with what you're doing? So, um, so yeah, that story was something I worked on for three years and it was about these two guys on death row who became best friends over the course of 20 years by playing Dungeons and Dragons in solitary confinement. And um, that was, you know, that, that was a heartbreaking story to write in some ways because, um, you know, one of the men has been executed and the other one is, is still there. Actually, the other one um, made this, the guy, Tony, Tony from that story, he made this. It is a ring made out of a domino. No way. Yeah. It is, um, carved with a razor and uh, buffed it on the floor of a cell. I went in to visit him one time and I was like, how do you have a ring like that? And I know that is not allowed. And he was like, oh, I'll make you one. But then he actually just sent me his. Um, but in any case, I, I wrote that story um, because I just thought that this was the first time I heard that they did this. I thought this was just such a fascinating thing. And um, and then the next time I asked someone about it, the person told me, oh yeah, well I used to play D&D, &D, but then the state killed the rest of my, um, the rest of my, the guys I played with, the rest of my raiding crew. And, um, and I was like, wow, I didn't, I hadn't thought through the heartbreaking logistics of how this game works on death row. And, um, for the next few years, every time I visited, I would ask more and more about, like, do you play? Do you play? Like, who plays with you? And the wild thing is, a lot of them didn't even know each other's names. They'd been on, they'd been in solitary together for years or decades, and they only knew each other's prison names in some cases. So it was actually hard tracking down who all played. And I kept coming back to Tony and Billy, and eventually I realized that this was a story about the, the lengths that people have to go to to try to bond with other people and you know put themselves in a world where they can you know relate to other people and they can make all these choices because mm -hmm. that's the one place you can make all of these choices on death row right like and this is the lengths that they have to go to to overcome like what it means to be in solitary so I was hoping this was going to be a story about uh, you know looking at solitary but from a very different perspective instead of just being like this is bad these are the horrible things they go through like looking at it through the lens of what they do to overcome it um, and I do think the story did that um, there's also Tony and Billy have you know an, a, an amazing friendship and and Billy's story was great I think um, in, especially in contrast to Tony's because Tony I think has a very strong innocence claim um, but Billy is un, you know was unquestionably guilty and I think that his story was to me so powerful because um, it forces you to grapple with like when a guilty person can can still be deserving of your consideration and your mercy 
And that is something that journalism often does not do. Like we tend to focus on the wrongfully convicted, on on the innocent, oh, yeah. especially in death row. Yep. You know, and I got to pair those two together in a story. Now I didn't get into the details of their cases as much as I would have hoped, but um, I think uh, this seems like this is probably going to be like my next book. So um, I think it's going to be like part D and D, part like sort of reporting memoir, or at least that's what that's what it is today. Who knows what it'll be a month from now? But <laughs> this is where I'm going with it, and we're also. Um, you know, having conversations about what it would look like adapting this to film or TV. So um, I feel like Death Row is going to continue to be like a big part of my sort of writing life for the next uh, several years. Mm -hmm. I really like what you just said about who we consider deserving of consideration. That's really important. And how you've kept coming back through our conversation to the idea that choice and autonomy is what makes us human in some ways in concert with our connection. I really appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Thanks for chatting. I'm curious to hear the questions from whoever is giving us questions. I'm looking over. Um, but thank you for this conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you both very much. At this time, we will start our question and answer session. Because this program is being recorded, we ask that you raise your hand and wait for a microphone to reach you. Um, and then you can ask your question. Um, we reserve the first question for students, and then we will open it up to the rest of the audience. So at this point, we're looking for our first question. Hi. Um, as an inspiring anthropologist, one thing that really stood out to me about your story was how you were able to facilitate all of these connections, especially in situations where there's so many boundaries. And I think that's a really difficult thing to do, to forge these relationships that allow you to connect that deeply with people. So I was wondering if you could share more about what the process is like when you're meeting someone new in the system, and also, are you do you go, do you set any boundaries purposefully? Do you think that you can set boundaries at all when you're forming these relationships? So I think, um, you know, I, I think that, so, so first of all, so some of the ways that I would approach a, a new relationship in, in these places is um, because I've been doing this long enough, I have some, I, I have some name. Like typically um, when we're talking about Texas prisons at least or, or death row, like, they would often know who I am, and I'm, I'm surprised at the extent to which this happens in other states as well. Um, so, I, I, so I think it's a, a little different now than it used to be, but I, I try to be upfront about like my own past because I, I, I do want them to know that I understand where they're coming from. And um, also just, you know, that we can sort of speak the same language about this. Um, but in terms of boundaries, I think that's a really interesting question because I think I do set a boundary in a different place than a lot of people in journalism because um, I feel like if I am asking people to in some cases take pretty significant personal risks to talk to me or to relive some, you know, some pretty awful traumas in some cases, like I feel like it's also my responsibility to, um, to clean that up. You know, if that person tells me, uh, you know, if, if, if somebody tells me, their whole like crime and how they got there or just some horrible incident of brutality or about their awful childhood, if they are sharing these really intimate things with me and they call me at like, you know, two in the morning crying because um, they're, you know, they're dealing with just having relived this, like I generally try to make myself available for that call. Like obviously I can't always um, and, you know, there are definitely people where it's like I, you know, I, I can't, I can't do this now. I can't be there as much as you need. Um, but I do try to, I do, I try to be very cognizant of that because one of the things that, you know, we do as reporters is we're asking people to share really deep traumas with us. And I think that there's been sort of historically this view that like you need to be very uh, sort of distant and like emotionally closed off about it. Um, but you know, I, I feel like it's really important to treat the person you're interviewing 
as a person instead of as um, like a subject, you know. Y'all asked me so many questions today, you ran out. <laughs> I've talked to like three groups of people before this. Like, we, do we really just run everyone out of questions? Amazing. <laughs> oh, no, there it is. Um. I just want to say uh, thank you for uh, coming and giving this talk. And I was um, curious about um, something that you said earlier about how when you were in prison, um, the uh, one thing that you feared was uh, solitary. And as somebody who studies, uh, so is studying solitary confinement right now, I'm curious as you, uh, what are your thoughts, I, uh, if you feel comfortable sharing maybe your own personal experiences in solitary? Or um, what are like your kind of experiences with other prisoners about their kind of how they understand solitary confinement, how they experience it? You know, how is how is how does that um, sort of punishment shape a lot of sort of prison life? Um, you know, I I think that there are some people that sort of feared it as much as I did or um, struggled with it as much as I did. I I was. I sort of just immediately lost my shit. Like I, I did not handle that well, like from the outset. Um, but I think there's also a lot of people who will tell you up front that they don't mind it or it's not that bad. I, I've, I've, I've encountered that in a lot of interviews. But then when you sort of drill down and start asking more detailed questions about, you know, ways this has impacted their mental state, like you, you start to uncover like yeah, there really are a lot of, like, you are really experiencing a, a lot of problems that seem tied to you being stuck in this little box all the time. Um, so I think that even among people who are experiencing or have experienced solitary confinement, um, I think there's still a tendency to be somewhat dismissive of the impacts of it. Um, but then, you know, there I, I think there are also definitely people who are very aware of it um, I mentioned at the big, I mentioned earlier that there was a guy that uh, the first time I, I'd interviewed him and asked him about D and D, um, he said that he stopped playing because the state had killed all his friends. Um, that guy was at that time very cogent and sane. And um, during, I'm going to say maybe in like 2021, like they were still doing some lockdowns and stuff in prisons. Um, there was one point where they had them locked down for when I arrived to interview the guy in the next cell. That guy was Ron. When I went to interview Ron, you know, he told me they'd been on lockdown for long enough that they hadn't gotten out to shower or go to rec or anything. They had not left their cells in 51 days. And, um, and he was telling me that he was worried that the guy in the next cell seemed like he was losing his mind. Like he had been previously like he didn't have mental health claims in his litigation like he had been I mean I'd, I'd visited him he he'd seemed cogent and you know Ron was like yeah and he's 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 starting to unravel and I'm, I'm concerned about him and he teared up as he was telling me about how hard it was to watch the guy in the next cell like his longtime close friend start losing his mind and start you know hearing voices and uh, thinking that there were conspiracies against him. Um, and he was like, you know, the only thing I have in here is my mind. Like, that's it. I'm in a cell. I only have my mind. Like, I can't lose that. And he was afraid to get too engaged in helping his friend, you know, shouting through the cell wall, trying to provide some form of therapy. Um, and he was afraid to get too involved because he didn't want to lose his mind, but he didn't want to ask to get moved because he was afraid that whoever might be there instead would just be like, yeah, those voices are real. You should go attack them. Um, and he was, you know, tearing up as he was telling me about this. And I mean, that that was a really heartbreaking, dark moment to witness to see someone, you know, worried about their own sanity and and being trapped in a cell, listening to your close friend lose his mind in the next cell. 
Um, and, you know, a few years later, I mean, the, the guy in the next cell, who I'm not naming because Ron didn't want him to be named, um, the guy in the next cell uh, has not gotten better. He has gotten clearly worse. And um, it used to be that he would, it wouldn't show up in his letters to me. Like, I couldn't tell that he was unraveling. But now it has become apparent even in what he's writing to me. I mean, I'd heard about it from a number of people who were growing increasingly concerned. But, you know, the point at which this became apparent to everyone in his life was when, during this prolonged lockdown. And like, sure, that might have happened anyways. I, I mean, but it really seems like this happened during a particularly intense bout of solitary after two decades of it. Um, and I, I think, you know, that's a, a really clear example of the toll of solitary for someone who was not like saying, hey, this is driving me crazy. I think I'm going to lose my mind. Like, this isn't someone who was like ostensibly particularly bothered by it any more than any of them are. But, um, you know, the, and the, this is all just to say that I, I, I think even for the people who are experiencing it, the toll is not always immediately apparent or it doesn't become apparent until, you know, to afterwards, until you, you know, have the trauma, until you have the PTSD, until you get out and realize that this is the thing that still haunts you. Um, I know you touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, I was wondering, as someone who has been incarcerated, would you consider yourself to be a prison ab abolitionist or someone who fights for prison reform? So I feel like as a reporter, I can't like ethically take a position on that, right? Because I cover prisons. Um, I actually, I feel like I've done like multiple TikToks on this. <laughs> and I get to ask this a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think that, um, I think what I can say is that uh, I find it really problematic the extent to which those two are typically viewed as, or not typically, are commonly viewed as mutually exclusive. Like, you know, if, if, you're gonna, if people take the position that, you know, you should never put money into a broken system, um, they're often doing that um, by sort of prioritizing their own personal ideology over the actual welfare of the people there. You know, like, if you don't, put money into a prison because you don't think there should be prisons, you, you're also like condemning those people to the moldy bread that I described, you know? So um, I do think I can, you know, without sort of violating any journalistic ethics, say that I think it's problematic to view them as mutually exclusive, which I'm obviously not calling you out on or anything like that. That's just sort of the, the way that these two ideas are typically framed or commonly framed. Um, as if they're mutually exclusive. And I, I, I don't think they need to be. Like, people can still have, or not have, you know, whatever, a goal of abolition, and in the meantime, recognize that, you know, there are things that people can do now. Um, I also did spend, like, seven years in Texas where, like, I mean, you can say you're for abolition, but, like, I'm for flying cars. I mean, you know, it's just, it's not even a helpful framework in, in a lot of places. Um, I have a question about um, after you're out of prison, because um, one thing prison do to you is like it, it institutionalize people, right? Um, I'm wondering if you're comfortable, if you can share your experience, or perhaps just like, would you do stories or interview people after they're out of prison? Um, sorry, are you asking, do I, have I done stories about people out, out of prison? I could only hear parts what of that. What was reentry like okay. for you or for people who you profiled? Okay, or? all right. Um, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I detail this in the book, right? But I think one of the things that um, surprised me about reentry was like I'd spent 
so long with just the goal of getting out. You know, like that's it, like, which is a really like a very simple goal. Like you literally just need to wait for time to pass. That, that's it. And that's like your big accomplishment that time has passed. And then I got out and I was like, oh, wow, what now? You know, this had been sort of my only or my most significant accomplishment for the past few years was literally just letting time pass. And then I get out and the people around me, the people that I knew from before have like actually done things. The world has moved on, you know? And, um, and I was just like, I don't even know where to start here. Um, so I, I think, I think it, that just the sort of, I don't know, like the, the sort of existential crisis of release was something that I did not at all anticipate. Hmm. Um, but it's been, it's also, this is another thing that's been really interesting about having this group of like prison TikTok friends, because it's been really interesting to see some of them are pretty, or were when we met, like pretty recently out. And it's been really interesting to see how people at different ages with like different amounts of time reintegrate. And I mean, I think that our group is probably like kind of a, you know, slanted group in that like these are all sort of people who are interested in, um, you know, really capitalizing on their second chances and, uh, and, you know, speaking out about prisons and prison conditions. So it's probably, it's, you know, much higher sort of success rate post incarceration than I think you're going to typically see. But um, it's still been amazing to, to watch people learn how to come back and how to navigate all these different relationships after years away. Um, one of the guys that I am that I'm friends with that I really like is um, Second Chancer on TikTok. Um, his name's Jesse Crossan, um, and he was in from like 17 or 18 until like 38, um, maybe 37. I mean, he was in for about 20 years. So it's so wild to me to to you know for him like he had for years not had any um, friendships or any kinds of relationships with like women except for those in uniform. You know, like occasionally, like there's some people that would be visiting, but like you don't have the sort of daily experience of learning how to interact with the other gender. Um, and like that, I once we, we met and like we became friends and all, and I was just like, it's so, it, it's so interesting to me to see how that, you know, how that plays out for him. And he's been so open both to me personally and on his, you know, on his TikTok in, in talking about how to navigate those relationships. And, you know, this is just one of the things that I don't think we even consider when we think about what a long prison sentence means, that you will put someone in the position even of, of getting to their late 30s and never having as an adult interacted, you know, as a free adult having interacted with, you know, a woman on equal footing as opposed to someone who's in a uniform telling you what to do. Um, and it's just, it, it's, it's so wild because this is not something that I thought about in the context of, of my prison experience. Um, but yeah, I think, have, I think this has been sort of amazing to see how other people handle reentry and what the most difficult struggles are for other people who've done it at different ages, different lengths of time, you know, different prison systems. We have time for two more questions. Um, so often in the media, like relation, interpersonal relationships in prisons are depicted as kind of like very violent or built entirely out of necessity, like prison gangs. But then you mentioned a very deep friendship. So I was wondering if you could go more in depth about the kind of interpersonal relationships you see. Yeah. Um, I mean, prisons can be violent places, but I don't think they are in the way that they are portrayed in media. And, and um, some prison systems are much worse than others when it comes to that. Um, in women's prison, for instance, in pretty much any state in the places that I've seen, uh, you know, women are statistically less likely to engage in violence in prison. Um, and even in men's prison, it is very often, you know, it's, it's not randomized, right? Uh, so in many situations, if you stick to certain sets of like codes of behavior and rules, like 
you, you can protect yourself from things happening. This is not universally true. California prisons are just got some real fucked up violence going on there. Um, but in many systems, like it's it's just not the sort of like randomized shank attack in the shower for no reason. Um, there are shank attacks in the shower, but um, they are not as pervasive um, or common as you would think in most systems. I do think Georgia is an absolute shit show in that respect, and uh, California is not great. Um, but I think like Texas prisons, like they're bad in a lot of ways, but uh, they were not as violent as some systems. And despite whatever violence there is, you know, there's still going to be friendship. You know, just like people have friendship amidst like war. You know, you can have people around you who might be engaging in violence, um, and it it can end up just, if anything, like trauma bonding you. You know, like there's still going to be friendship and humanity. And um, I was specifically talking about like death row with that D and D story, which is not a violent population. Like they are. Um, I think a lot of people on death row are, are not the demographic of prisoners you would even think they are. Um, I think there's a sort of perception that they're like all serial killers and rapists, and that is not the majority of people that are on death row. Um, like, not that they don't have behavioral problems at all, but death row is typically uh, less violent than in, uh, you know, uh, other parts of prisons. Um, I was wondering, as a writer, how do you get the hard stuff on paper? Um, and also, how do you get to be okay with sharing the very personal things that you've experienced with such a wide audience? And then also, how do you make those experiences accessible for people that might not have experienced that? Or, I don't want to use the word palatable, but... I don't think I'm good at the palatable work? part, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it's all pretty dark, right? Like, um, so, um, so let's see. So, I, I mean, I don't know you had like a whole bunch of questions in there. I'm not even sure which one to pick. Um, but in terms of, okay, like, how do I get the hard stuff onto paper? Um, I think that. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, as I know that I'm going to write about a thing, like I'm thinking through it, right? And when it gets to a point that, like, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking enough, it, it bothers me enough, like, that it, it needs to come out, um, I think that's part of it. But, you know, there's also just some of the really heartbreaking stuff I cover, um, I feel like I, I need to get out, need to get it out so that people can read it and understand. And, you know, I can't, um, you know, change the course of what's going to happen in so many of these situations. But, like, I can be the person that at least tells their story. And for some people, like, that's enough to know that other people knew what happened to them and what they went through. Um, you know, and sometimes that is not much consolation, but sometimes I also know that, like, that is the, the best thing that I can offer this person, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and with that, we'll conclude tonight's program. I want everyone to please join me in thanking um, Carrie Blake and Jaren Provost Kramer. Thank you.